Welcome to God and Country Biblical Exposition. This week is the final program in my three-part series, Socialism, Biblical or Unbiblical. The idea of socialism, collectivism, communism has staged a comeback, and we're hearing story after story of college students being taught the wonderful virtues of socialism by leftist professors. And it's no surprise that America, in her departure from God, is moving toward socialism economics. The idea of socialism is not really based on economic fact. It comes out of a certain worldview regarding what people believe about man and God and sin and human purpose. In general, socialism is the child of secular humanism. Free enterprise capitalism is the child of Christianity. And if you don't understand the theology behind socialism, the worldview, you really don't understand the motives and the purpose of socialism. In short, without God, government becomes God. Without a judgment day, it's a government that has to settle all the scores. And without God's provision, the government has to become the safety net. And without heaven, earthly materialism becomes everything. Your value and your worth get tied up in what you have compared to everyone else. And this is how Karl Marx saw the world, how he judged people's worth. And Marx was very disappointed that he could never get Christians on board with his communism. Because we did not believe that life consists in the abundance of the things people possess. So Christians were not envious. Uh, we were not interested in economic egalitarianism. Christ radically changes a nation, a people's worldview, their economic outlook. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. Uh, one of the uh, classic works in modern conservatism uh, was William Buckley's first book that he wrote in 1951, God and Man at Yale. And this is the book that propelled William Buckley into the limelight, and he began his career as being the premier conservative thinker in America at the end of the last century. And this book is an account of the liberalism that he saw at Yale as a student back in the 50s. And he writes about all the teachers who were teaching secular atheism, liberal theology, and socialism. And it's really no wonder that America has gone astray. Because 70 years ago, the Ivy League schools uh, had all abandoned Christian values. And one of the points that Buckley makes is that once God and Christianity are abandoned, immediately the political ideology goes from the individual to the collective, from the free market to the socialistic. Why? I think it happens on a subconscious level. Because once you abandon God and the hope of Christ and the goal of world evangelism and the purpose of life to glorify God, the heart and the mind of the unbeliever leans toward confidence in man, in the government of man. In his book, William Buckley has a chapter about how individualism is gone at Yale. He writes, if there's a student who believes in enterprise, self-reliance, independence, it is only because he has not listened to the teachers who disparage individuals, glorify government, enshrine security, and discourage self-reliance. And this is back in the 1950s. And he entitled the book God and Man at Yale because he understood it's really a theological issue. So, by way of review, the emphasis of my first program was about the importance of this subject, that the Bible does have something to say about economic systems, that part of discipleship includes teaching people about the ethical use of money, both personally and nationally. The second program dealt mostly with the underlying motives behind socialism, either greed or desire for power 
or naivety or irresponsibility. On this third program, I want to discuss proofs against socialism. Uh, the arguments against socialism need to be divided up into three categories. The historic arguments, the pragmatic arguments, and the ethical moral arguments. Uh, the moral arguments would be those direct biblical injunctions against socialism. Uh, it's, it's wrong simply because God says it's wrong. Biblical property rights. But we will hear historic and pragmatic arguments quite often. And it's very helpful to keep these uh, categories in mind so that when you discuss socialism with other people, you can say to them, oh, well, that's the historic argument or, or that's the pragmatic argument or you're making a, a moral argument here. Because if you don't make that distinction, the whole discussion can get twisted up in wrong categorical thinking, confusing the moral argument with the pragmatic argument. One person is trying to make the moral argument and the other is trying to refute it with the pragmatic argument, as if the pragmatic argument trumps the moral argument. Well, first, let's look at this historic argument. America was founded to escape from the European model of the bureaucratic nobles, who would take the money from the peasants and then give it back to them in the form of social services as the nobles saw fit. The colonists came to America to leave the socialist system. Notice the following quotes from Thomas Jefferson. A wise and frugal government, which shall leave men free to regulate their own pursuits of industry and improvement, and shall not take from the mouth of labor bread it has earned. This is the sum of good government. Also, the democracy will cease to exist when you take away from those who are willing to work and give to those who would not. My reading of history convinces me that most bad government results from too much government. The government is best, which governs the least, because its people discipline themselves. I think myself that we have more machinery of government than is necessary. Too many parasites living on the labor of the industrious. I predict future happiness for America if they can prevent the government from wasting the labors of the people under the guise of taking care of them. So... How was Jefferson so able to speak so clearly against socialism? Because the tyranny of socialism is nothing new. The founders understood the game that was being played by the ruling class in Europe. The old governments in Europe told the people that they were taking their money to give it back to them in the form of government services. And as I said in the last program, socialism will always result in a bureaucratic ruling class handing out resources versus a peasant working class. And our founders wanted nothing to do with that form of government. Through the experience of history, they believed, even with all of the risks and the problems inherent in individualism, it was still a better system. It's far better for people to be independent. It's better to be doing business and charity through the individual and family rather than collectively through the state. And for those who say that you cannot trust individuals to be fair and charitable in their economic decisions, Jefferson had an answer for that. He wrote, sometimes it is said that man cannot be trusted with the government of himself. Can he then be trusted with the government of others? Or have we found angels in the form of kings to govern him? Let history answer this question. What Jefferson was saying is that given the propensity of government to become tyrannical, it's far better to leave the individual with economic decisions. Give the, the power to the people, not to the state. And this is America. And we are an experiment in economic freedom. This is the covenant or the contract that we all made together. And if you don't like that and you want to trade your freedom for security, then go and move to Venezuela, move to Cuba, move, move to Russia or to any uh, state in Europe that is moving towards socialism. 
It's just the honest thing to do. Leave people alone who want to be economically free. If you're at Chick-fil-A and you want a hamburger, don't demand that Chick-fil-A makes hamburgers. Go over to Burger King. But what this new generation of socialists are wanting to do is to outvote people who came here and who are coming here for economic freedom. Those who want to take the risk and live free of government collectivism. I mean, yes, there are always those who will want serfdom and slavery. They want other people to take care of them. I mean, that is, again, 1 Samuel chapter 8. They want a king to fight their battles. They want the king, the government, to fight their health care battles and their child-rearing battles and their retirement battles and their education battles. But if you want that, go and live with the Philistines. Go and live with the Moabites. This is Israel where God fights our battles. But a very telling thing always happens. Socialists never want to leave America. They never want to go to socialist countries that have high taxes and where there's very little business infrastructure, uh, where the standard of living is half that of the United States, because socialism is parasitic. Socialists want to use the wealth built up by free market, free capitalistic enterprise and personal accountability. But now they want that wealth to be given to them through collectivist redistribution. Socialism is parasitic. It lives off the host and it eventually kills the host. So that is basically the historic argument. And of course, all of these arguments overlap because there is a moral argument underpinning the historic argument that it's unethical to remove the ancient boundaries. Proverbs 22, 28, do not move the ancient boundaries which your fathers have set. Now, the second argument, which is really the most popular, is the economic pragmatism argument. And the reason for the popularity of pragmatism is because we live in the age of secularism. People shy away from making arguments based on moral absolutes because modern man believes that right and wrong needs to be determined by experience or by pragmatism like the people in Elijah's day. The God who is true is the God who answers by fire. And that is a prime example of where uh, pragmatism leads when it's the foundation for ethics. It really didn't turn out very well for Elijah. Now, it's not that we should never use pragmatism. Even God uses it. But it must always be secondary to the moral argument. Uh, one of the uh, YouTube comments on a previous program on socialism came from a woman born in Czechoslovakia. And she comments that she saw what German socialism did to her country and then what Soviet socialism did to her country. And she, like many other Eastern Europeans coming to America, want nothing to do with socialism because they have discovered from experience that it is a lie. It does not work. As is often said, a conservative is a liberal who's been mugged. And nations that have tried socialism have been mugged. As Churchill said, you know, eventually you run out of other people's money. Reality slaps people in the face. Like the prodigal, he had to feed the swine and then he came to his senses. Socialism has resulted in more poverty everywhere it's been tried. It is equalized misery. Not only do you bring down the standards of the wealthy, you reduce the standards of the poor. You lower the tide and all ships sink. On the other hand, capitalism has done more to raise the standards of living and eliminate poverty more than any socialist state or any socialist program has ever done. And in capitalistic nations, even the poor are rich by the standard of socialistic nations. Socialism produces less economic activity and hence less wealth and less services. There's, there's an old joke in the Soviet Union that a Russian goes in to buy a car and, he, and he's told that there's a 10-year wait. 
So the buyer says to the dealer, well, in 10 years, is the car going to be delivered in the morning or in the evening? And the dealer says to him, well, like, what difference does it make? And the buyer says, well, the plumber is coming in the morning. Well, that's really not too far from the truth. The shelves were and are empty in socialistic communist countries. And what brought down communism was this undeniable fact that countries that practice economic freedom, not collectivism, were not only wealthy, they were far advanced in technology. The United States pretty much bankrupted the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union could not keep up. Now, why is this? Why doesn't collectivism work pragmatically? And this is where conservatives need to point out to socialists that they really do not understand human nature. Not that man in his sin needs to compete, but that man in his sin will become lazy if he is not held personally responsible for his own welfare. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. For we hear that some of you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busy buddies. Now, secular humanists tend to believe that man is basically good, that man doesn't need personal accountability and responsibility, but people will not work unless if they don't work, they don't eat. Proverbs 16, 26, a worker's appetite works for him for his hunger urges him on. And again, the prodigal son, Luke chapter 16, if he had a complete safety net, if he could depend on the collective work of the society to support his basic needs, he would not have resorted to feeding the pigs and he would not have been motivated to better his situation. He would have instead hung out in the bars and lived off of his welfare check or his SSI check or his basic income check. They actually tried that in Finland. $1,600, $16,000 a year for everyone, but it was a complete failure. It doesn't work pragmatically. Collectivism will result in laziness. It creates many non-producers. And the reason for this is that work is a very fragile, tenuous activity. Think about this. Work is so disagreeable to us that we have to work by the sweat of our brow, as it says in Genesis chapter 3, that we will abandon it the first chance we get. You know, as soon as the government taxes us too much, the incentive to work is gone. And the curve on that graph is steeper than what most people consider. As soon as the government will hand us a check, as soon as the government will provide us a safety net, we abandon work. And we're not better off with a government safety net. We're actually worse off. And there's a whole class of people who would immediately throw off personal responsibility and not go to the work if the government just provided the smallest safety net. I know many people who would be more than willing to live on a quarter of the money they make now if they did not have to go to work. For many people, free time is worth a whole lot more than money. And most guys could live out of the back of a van on what you could get on a typical welfare check and they'd be happy to do so. You know, I was recently buying some um, hard to find car parts online. And as I was looking at these car parts, it really amazes me that there are people out there who will go through all of the trouble to create the product, to, to, to stock it, to advertise it, to ship it, and to sell these specialty car par parts for just 20 bucks. And it occurred to me, and it should occur to you, that it wouldn't take much for that entrepreneurial supplier to say the heck with it. It's just too much trouble. It is too much of a headache. Why even bother? The government's just going to take my profit. Uh, the other guy is going to claim that it belongs to him in the form of some sort of collectivism. So I'm going to go fishing. I'm just going to take my marbles and go home. 
And that's what happens a million times over in socialist collective economies. People don't work unless they are personally responsible for their own welfare. They will not work. They will not build. They will not invest if they don't have to work to eat or to have a roof over their head or if the government takes too much profits. And what I'm just simply saying here is that the work ethic in a nation can be destroyed very easily. And if everything is shared collectively, if other people are forced to share with me in healthcare and in education and retirement and in housing, it is natural to want to do the least possible work for the most possible benefit. So eventually what has to happen in socialistic economies, when you remove the profit motive, is that the state has to force people to work. And that's why socialism, collectivism, communism will always degenerate into a form of slavery or feudalism there always has to arise state taskmasters so that if you don't do the work, the state will take away your rations. So in short, this is the pragmatic argument. The empirical evidence that socialism results in poverty and the reason is the motivations of human nature. Pragmatism is really a great reality check. Some people only learn by pragmatism. But there is a problem in judging right and wrong by pragmatism. That is, if you can only discover what is right by experience, because the experiment itself may actually run the nation into the ground and create pain and sorrow for generations. And once you lose everything, it's hard to get it back again. So rather than just operating on pragmatism, we need to operate on a higher moral ethic so we don't have to learn by our failures. Now, fortunately, in the 20th century, we do have the empirical proof of the failure of socialism. The experiment has been done for us. And this failure of socialism has been a real problem for socialists. But again, we all know that socialism is not dying, regardless of the pragmatic arguments. Because for many, the desire for a certain ideological state of affairs trumps everything. Socialism has to work because they want it to work, because for the socialist, the envy driving the desire for equality makes equality a moral necessity, regardless of the results. In fact, they don't even care if everyone becomes more poor as long as the rich guy doesn't have more than they do. So now let's look at the moral argument. Because a socialist could easily refute the first two arguments against socialism because Christians understand that something is not necessarily true just because it's historic. I mean, Thomas Jefferson, our founders, might have gotten it wrong. And just because something results in more wealth doesn't necessarily mean that it's right. I mean, after all, since when do we determine what is morally right by the money it produces? It might actually be more fair to have everyone equal, even if equality means less wealth, wealth for everyone, if equality is the moral imperative. So this final argument, the moral argument, is the only argument that truly matters. Socialism is wrong not just because it doesn't work. It's wrong because it's evil. And this is where we need to turn to the Bible. A moral authority outside of ourselves. Now, the biblical argument is very broad and it's alluded to throughout the Bible, you, but you will never find in the Bible a statement that says, thou shall not do socialism. Now, that's not because uh, the Bible is for socialism or that the Bible is neutral toward economic systems, but the Bible just doesn't use modern economic jargon. Nevertheless, the economic concepts opposing socialism and favor, favoring capitalism is throughout the Bible. First in the law, the Eighth Commandment, thou shalt not steal. Also the Tenth Commandment, thou shalt not covet your neighbor's house or your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So intrinsic in those commands is the right to personal property and the right to the labor of your own hands. It is a human right. 
Then also is the pattern that God gave to Israel. The pattern was that the poor were not to be taken care of through social collectivism, but through individual and state charity. As in the book of Ruth, provision was made for the poor to glean the corners of the farmer's field. Leviticus 23:22, when you reap the harvest of your land, moreover, you shall not reap to the very corners of your field, nor gather the gleaning of your harvest. You are to leave them for the needy and the alien. I am the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 14, 28. At the end of every third year, you shall bring out all the tithe of your produce in that year and shall deposit it in your town. The Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance among you, and the alien, the orphan, and the widow who are in the town shall come and eat and be satisfied in order that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand, which you do. So this was a 10% tax every three years that was given to the poor. And again, Christian capitalism supports charity for the poor. But that is a completely different system than collectivism, where people are forced to do all of their business together through the state, and then the state redistributes the wealth. And remember again, 1 Samuel 8, the prophet Samuel rebukes the people in their sin, in their throwing off a personal responsibility in favor of a nanny state, a form of collectivism. Now, religious people who are advocates for socialism will insist that Old Testament economic law was not meant to be normative. In other words, it was not to be a pattern or a principle. But if that is true, then the Bible loses much of its ability to become a moral guide. 2 Timothy 3.16, we believe all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. God is communicating timeless truths about the use of money. Also, when we get to the New Testament, Jesus sounds very capitalistic. Jesus gives a number of parables concerning the rights of landowners, such as Matthew 21, 33. The servants, the employees, did not have the right to the farm. And Jesus also rebuked the man who insisted that his brother shares the inheritance with him. Biblically, economic egalitarianism is not necessary because we all have different gifts and calling. The sharing spoken of in the early church in Acts chapter 2 and 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 13 was not state collectivism, but voluntary sharing. And then we have the teachings of the apostles concerning individual responsibility. 2 Thessalonians 3, 8, Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with labor and hardship we kept working night and day so that we would not be a burden to any of you. 2 Thessalonians 3.10, If anyone is not willing to work, neither should he eat. Then there are also commands concerning family responsibility. 1 Timothy 5.8, If anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. It was never the responsibility of the state to take everyone's retirement dollars and redistribute them in Social Security. It was always to be the responsibility of the family. So that back in the 1940s, if old age meant poverty, then the state should have passed a law requiring children and uncles and aunts to take care of their own elderly relatives. That would have corrected all sorts of social ills, but instead the state took over retirement and that actually created more social ills. Uh, then in the Bible, there are all sorts of ancillary principles that speak against socialism, the tendency of human nature to be lazy, uh, the tendency of governments to abuse economic power, Genesis chapter 11, uh, the Tower of Babel, uh, we have Revelation 13, the economic command and control empire of the Antichrist, and all the, that the Bible teaches about how collectivism not only thwarts the sowing and the reaping principle, but it empowers evil people. And that for me is one of the greatest concerns of socialism. The state using money to fund freeloaders, to fund easy chair liberal philosophers, uh, to fund humanist universities, uh, the church of secularism, to fund Planned Parenthood, to fund the LGBT agenda. God broke up 
the government in Genesis 11 at Babel because when mankind gains central control, political or economic, it will always empower evil. Well, the clock is against me here. So all I can give you is this brief overview. But I hope you understand the basics. That the Bible, in all of its examples, and in all of its direct teaching, directs a nation toward economic freedom. Personal responsibility rather than collectivism. And that's why nations with Christian people and with a Christian worldview are nations that promote individualism and economic freedom. Now some commentary on the culture. So we've all heard the latest news on the Kavanaugh hearings. But I want to discuss a broader lesson that applies to many situations. So many people are saying that they believe Ford's testimony merely on the basis of her intensity, her emotions, her facial expressions. And they say that she wouldn't be lying about this. People are saying, I believe all survivors. 1,600 men took out an ad in the New York Times saying that they believe Ford's testimony. All 1,600 men who took out that ad are fools because you cannot determine truth or error based on a person's testimony. Even leading media personalities are claiming that they can discern that Ford is telling the truth. There's an article in PJ Media, students demanding professors be fired after a champion's due process after he says accusers sometimes lie. Nearly 100 students at the University of Southern California attended a rally at noon on Monday demanding a tenured professor be fired after he sent a reply all email last Thursday to the student body, noting that accusers sometimes lie. Quote, if the day comes, you are accused of some crime or tort of which you are not guilty, and you find your, your peers automatically believe in your accuser, I expect you'll find yourself a stronger proponent of due process than you are now, emailed Professor James Moore. But let's all learn the following lesson, and it's going to serve you well throughout life. You cannot tell when a person is lying or telling the truth. Just admit it to yourself right now. You are not Sherlock Holmes. Now, I'm not talking about cases where you have evidence that you have a picture in front of you or some documentation. I'm talking about cases where you think you can tell whether a, whether a person is lying or telling the truth by the genuineness of their testimony, by their emotions, by their sincerity, by their body language. Now, there are some articles on the web that claim that you can tell if a person is lying by body language or by the tone of their voice, but the more solid studies say, don't fool yourself, you cannot tell. Here's an article from the American Psychological Association. 253 studies of people distinguishing truth from lies reveal overall accuracy was just 53%. Not much better than flipping a coin. And here's an article from the New York Times itself, 1999. To tell the truth, it is awful hard to spot a liar. Most people are confident of their ability to detect falsehood, but in study after study, Dr. Paul Ekman, a professor of psychology in the School of Medicine at the University of California at San Francisco and his colleagues have demonstrated that most people perform miserably on the test, scoring at chance levels or slightly higher, even groups one might expect to possess particularly lie-catching abilities score poorly. Dr. Ekman has found police officers, trial court judges, FBI and CIA agents, trial lawyers, and forensic psychiatrists all demonstrate little more skill at picking out liars than a pipe fitter or a bus driver pulled from the street. And this lack of ability to detect liars is with people who are deliberate liars. What about someone like Ford who may actually believe what she is saying because she has mistakenly identified her attacker? Look up the accuracy of witnesses, witness testimony, 
and the accuracy of police lineups. People misidentify criminals all the time. So there are many people who actually believe they're telling the truth when actually they're telling a falsehood. So this is why biblical justice requires multiple eyewitnesses to collaborate evidence. Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15. A single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity or any sin which he has committed. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. So you're kidding yourself if you think you can discern from a person's testimony alone whether they are telling the truth. And the fact that professional pundits and news commentators in the media don't know this fact shows how uneducated and ignorant they are in these things and how gullible they are. Never believe anyone on the basis of personal testimony alone. Even if you agree with the politics of the person, you'd still be a fool by saying that you believe him on mere testimony alone. Always be suspicious. We have a saying here in New Jersey, if it's not in writing, it's a lie. And even then it's a lie. And this lesson that you cannot believe people based on testimony alone will help you throughout life. It'll help you on the job. It'll help you in dealing with your family and dealing with people in your church. Stop being so gullible. Stop thinking you have the power to discern people's truthfulness without collaborating evidence. You know, it's better to think, I just don't know, or I can't judge, than to say, hey, I can figure this out. And you know, as a pastor, I see this all the time. What people say is often at odds with reality. And so I have stopped believing people on testimony alone because most people are self-deceived professional liars. And it's really helped me in ministry not to just believe people on their testimony alone. So if you see a brother who believes or disbelieves a person based upon mere testimony, take that brother aside and share with him some of the facts of life. And let's remember the words of Jesus. Matthew chapter 7, verse 20. So then you will know them by their fruits. And in context, Jesus was saying, don't just go by people's words. Go by their actions. As Ronald Reagan said, trust, but verify. So thank you for listening to this lengthy expose on socialism. I hope it's been helpful. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. May God richly bless you as you continue in his word. As God told Joshua in Joshua 1.8, by doing according to the written words of the law, you will then make your way prosperous you will then have good success.